let's start out with a few questions. Okay, the questions are predominantly meant, predominantly meant for the white folks in the audience, but please, everyone else, feel free to play along. Okay, have you ever noticed a subtle tension when talking with your peers, your colleagues, even your friends of color? You know, like there's a concern, you may say or do something that could possibly give offense. Have you ever been at a talk or a presentation about race or racism, a workshop on cultural diversity, and felt like there are some folks trying to hold you to account for events neither you nor your ancestors had anything to do with? Perhaps you felt guilty, maybe even a little angry, at feeling like there are some people wanting to blame you for crimes in which you took no part. Have you ever done something you've been doing all your life, never given it a second thought, when on this particular day someone calls you out for being insensitive, inappropriate, maybe even racist? Well, I can answer yes to all those. I mean, those have happened a lot. I'll give you one small example. Back in the fall of 1990, I was doing work uh, for Self-Enhancement, Inc. SEI, if, you know, perhaps a bunch of folks have heard of them. Uh, just for those of you who haven't, SEI was founded by two African-American gentlemen with the purposes of serving African-American youth and their families in the black community here in North Northeast Portland, a community which, by the way, no longer exists. But that's, that's another story. So they gave me an opportunity to run a family literacy program. And the program had been up and running for, I don't know, three, four months, when on this nice Saturday morning at Maranatha Church, uh, the parents are reading with their children, children are reading to their parents, and I hear this one little girl reading aloud to her mom. And she must have been like six years old, maybe seven, and I had not heard her read before. And she was doing a really good job. So I waited for her to finish, and I went to validate her in the way my parents, my aunts, my uncles, my community validated us when we were little boys and girls. I patted her on the head and said, good job, well done, that was great. When from across the room, one of the other mothers screamed at me, what did you just do to that child? What did you just do? And I was like, what? And so I turned towards her and she's going, what did you just do to that child? And we're going, I, 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 I validated her, I congratulated her, I told her she did a good job. You patted her on the head. You pat dogs on the head. And it was, Oh my God. So I thought about it briefly, took her point, apologized to the little girl, apologized to her mom, apologized to everyone else in the room, and I don't believe I patted a child on the head since. <laughs> I can learn. Well, <laughs> this subtle tension, uh, confusion, anger, guilt, they are just a tiny thimble full of the consequences of 400 years of racial divide. They are just a tiny, 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 tiny drop in the bucket of the effects of 400 years of disconnection. We colloquially call this the color line. To me, it's not so much a line as it is a gash, a gaping wound through America's heart. And it is becoming increasingly imperative that we heal this wound. In the next 20 to 30 years, Americans of color will outnumber their white counterparts. Americans of color already do in 20 of our 25 most populous cities in all of our top 10. In the mid-1960s, 35% of the world's population was white. In the coming 20 or 30 years, that number is expected to be 10 or 11%. If our children and our grandchildren and some of us do not come to understand the ways of others, learn the mores and nuances of their cultures, and learn how to adapt, we and they will find ourselves in severe disadvantage. For those of our children and grandchildren, and those of us who do come to understand the ways of others, learn the mores and nuances of their culture, and learn how to adapt, we will find ourselves with many, many more opportunities for success. Now, while these demographic changes are proceeding apace, we are facing greater and greater challenges. Climate change, uh, ever-expanding wealth disparity, social injustices, poverty, water scarcity, it's a really long list. Now, I'm an optimist, and I believe we can solve our problems, and I believe we can meet our challenges. I also believe we will only be able to do so after we heal our wound. It's been said many times across many decades that if we are all going to thrive, we have to learn to live and work with one another. And certainly that's true. That's hard to argue with. However, given the changes we're in the midst of and the challenges we are facing, I believe we're going to need to do much more than that. We can learn to truly connect with one another. We can develop greater and greater capacity for understanding each other. We can build meaningful relationships of depth with each other. Simply, we can learn to be with each other. 
Now, Americans of color have been learning to be with white Americans since the beginning. Many have come to understand our ways, learn the mores and nuances of our culture, and many have adapted. We call this integration. Given that historically white Americans have generally been dis disinterested in, very often antagonistic towards, and more often than I would like to ever think about violent towards their fellow citizens, this effort has been in one direction. And the result has been 400 years of division and disconnection. So the talk we're about to embark upon for the next, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, is going to be about meaningfully connecting. It's going to be about growing ourselves in the presence of others different from ourselves. It's going to be about expanding our sense of community and what I call reverse integration.